So I have three uh, items to mention at the top, and then we'll get started. Um, first, with respect to the travel of the Secretary. Since arriving in Vienna last night, Secretary Kerry has had a variety of meetings and consultations with Baroness Ashton, Iranian Foreign Minister Zarif, French Foreign Minister Fabius, UK Foreign Secretary Hammond, and German Political Director Lucas. Those meetings are still ongoing. He continues to stay in close touch with his interagency colleagues in Washington. The situation on the ground remains fluid, so any updates to the itinerary will come from the Secretary's team on the ground. Second item, uh, the United States is deeply disappointed that Chinese authorities upheld the separatism conviction and life sentence for prominent Uyghur professor Ilham Toti in a closed jailhouse hearing today. His detention silenced an important Uyghur voice that peacefully promoted understanding among China's ethnic groups. We will continue to call for Chinese authorities to release Professor Toti. The United States is also deeply concerned about reports that veteran journalist Gao Yu is being tried on a charge of leaking state secrets to a foreign news outlet. The United States remains concerned by the ongoing detention and prosecution of public interest lawyers, journalists, bloggers, religious leaders, and others who challenge official Chinese policies and actions. We urge Chinese authorities to differentiate between peaceful dissent and violent extremism. And we continue to call on Chinese authorities to release all persons detained for peacefully expressing their views, to remove restrictions on their freedom of movement, and to guarantee them the protections and freedoms to which they are entitled under China's international human rights commitments, including the freedoms of expression and peaceful assembly. And last item, I would like to uh, welcome a group of young Palestinian journalists to the daily briefing uh, in the back. They are here today as part of an UNRWA-sponsored program, which brings young people to the United States to learn how journalists here engage on foreign policy and interact with the State Department, which you all are a model. So please, Lara, why don't you lead off? Uh, <laughs> um, <laughs> Thanks. Um, let's start with Iran, if we could. Sure. Uh, the last update we got from Vienna was that Secretary Kerry was planning on traveling back to Paris tonight. Is that still the case? Yeah, I don't have any update to his uh, travel schedule. Okay, but he's meeting I, with uh, Foreign Minister Zarif and um, Baroness Ashen right now. Well, is that he's right? had a variety of, of meetings. Uh, I, I, I can't tell you for, with certainty exactly whom he's sitting down with now. It's been, as I said, a very fluid situation with a number of meetings in bilateral, in multilateral settings, um, but those meetings continue um, as we speak. Right. And so it's getting kind of late in Vienna, hence the question mm -hmm. about what his travel plans are. I mean, the point, I suppose, of this is that, that since it's so fluid and since it's been going back and forth and some of these meetings seem like they have arisen at um, last minute notice, uh, what does that suggest in terms of the prospect of a deal and the state of the negotiations right now? Uh, well, I wouldn't uh, draw a particular conclusion from it. This is a fluid situation, um, and we're staying flexible uh, in terms of the logistics and, uh, and uh, travel uh, arrangements uh, as to what is needed on the ground. The United States intends to keep working hard to resolve the differences and to do everything in our power uh, to try to get, uh, to get across the finish line. Um, but uh, you know, with, with respect to uh, you know, the fact that meetings uh, are uh, continuing intensively, I think that shouldn't be a surprise, uh, given that we're nearing the, uh, the November 24th deadline. And does Secretary Kerry plan on staying in the region through the deadline, I mean, until the 24th? Again, I don't have anything to update as far as his uh, travel plans. I have no changes to announce. Can I say directly on the travel? Why, why is it that, I mean, if I don't understand why it might be necessary for him to leave and then come back. I mean. If his presence there is of utility, why doesn't he just stay there and hang out in a hotel or do whatever and uh, step in as necessary? And if his presence isn't necessary, why doesn't he just come back to Washington? I don't, I don't fully understand the need to hop to a new European city every couple of days here. Uh, well, again, his, uh, his travel uh, schedule is, is driven by uh, how he sees his time best used. Um, and he's had a variety of consultations this week in advance of arriving uh, in Vienna. He's there now. Uh, I don't have further announcements to make, but uh, you know, clearly he remains in close touch with his counterparts, uh, both within the P5 plus one as well as internationally and with the team in Washington. Are all other members of the team uh, notably uh, acting Deputy Secretary Sherman, former Deputy Secretary Burns, 
uh, former uh, uh, National Security Council official Jake Sullivan, are all of them staying? Again, I don't have anything to announce about the, their travel. They're in Vienna now. Uh, I, I don't have any announcements to make uh, about that. And can you offer any characterization uh, beyond what you already have on um, the nature of the talks, given that you are now three days to the uh, <coughs> to the deadline? Well, uh, given where we are in the negotiations, I'm not I'm not going to give readouts uh, of uh, of those meetings. Uh, uh. Earlier this week, you told us that uh, you said we're not talking about an extension. Are, I think that was on Wednesday. Mm -hmm. Are you now talking about an extension, given how close to the deadline you are? Uh, the situation on that hasn't changed either. We're focused on the 24th of November. Uh, that's that's and, what we're focused on. And the statement, we are not talking about an extension, is still true? Right, we're not uh, we're not talking about an extension with uh, with the Iranians. Uh, we're not uh, we're not focused on that. Are you but talking to your own partners yeah, about it? Right. It's not yeah. what we're focused on. Uh, we're focused on the twenty fourth. But can you make the same statement with regard to the Iranians, uh, with uh, about your five other negotiating partners that we are not talking about an extension? Again, I don't have readouts of, of the meetings that are ongoing uh, as we speak. Uh, what uh, what I said uh, is uh, that we are we are focused on the 24th. Uh, we're not focused uh, uh, on an extension. Would you dissuade us from concluding from your series of answers to these questions that you are, in fact, discussing the possibility of an extension with the other five, uh, <clears throat> just not with Iran? Again, uh, the meetings are ongoing on the ground. Uh, I, I am not going to persuade you or dissuade you um, uh, beyond what I've, uh, what I've said. Uh, again, it's a fluid situation. Is, is it conceivable to you that you could, and I'm not talking about a formal extension to some significant date, to some date in the future, is it conceivable to you that, as was the case uh, a year ago, that you might uh, that the negotiations might slide an extra few hours or 12 hours or day or two days? I mean, is it is it conceivable to you without a formal extension that you guys could, that all the parties could just keep talking through Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, maybe even Thursday? I appreciate the opportunity to comment on a hypothetical, but uh, I'm not I'm not going to. We're focused on the 24th. That's, that's where our energies are directed. I don't, technically, it's a hypothetical. I asked if something was conceivable to you. Again, we're focused on, on November 24th. Change of subject? Anything else on this topic? No, please, Elise. I'd like to return to the case of um, Taji Maidan. Um, you said yesterday, was it, was it yesterday? Or Wednesday. Wednesday, sorry. Um, that you were aware of the recent report um, published by the hum Human Rights Human Cou uh, Council Working Group on Arbitrary Detention. And you said you share many of the concerns related to his detention, and you take its work very seriously. Could you say yes. what areas of that report that you um, share their concerns about? Well, I'm not going to get into a further uh, characterization of the content of the report, um, but well, I will I, say... Uh, I, I, can, I can, I mean, there are reports that, that the, the detention was arbitrary. There are reports that about um, his alleged abuse in prison. There are legends, uh, allegations that the confession was, was forced. I mean, which of the confessions, which of the uh, allegations in the report do you share the concerns of? Or just the general nature that his detention has been arbitrary and that he should be released? Well, uh, as, as I mentioned uh, yesterday, you know, this is a case that we've uh, taken uh, very seriously. We've raised this at the highest levels uh, of the government of Bahrain. Uh, and we continue, we remain in contact uh, with them uh, about it. Uh, and our concerns uh, relate to uh, Mr. Almaidan's safety and welfare, his treatment in prison, including his medical and nutritional needs, uh, and the Bahraini court system's uh, judicial proceedings. When you say the, uh, the Bahraini uh, court system's judicial proceedings, are you suggesting that you feel that he did not get due process and didn't receive a fair trial? Uh, well, uh, uh, first, I would also note uh, in that uh, respect that uh, Mr. Maidan's attorney has informed us that they plan to appeal um, the uh, the verdict. Uh, 
of course, we'd refer you to them for any uh, additional information uh, on those steps uh, on their part. But in our discussions with the government of Bahrain uh, about this case, uh, we, we continue to emphasize the importance uh, of Bahrain's commitment uh, to, uh, to fair trial guarantees uh, required by international law. When you say that, that would indicate that you feel that the initial trial was not fair. Well, uh, I would say, again, we, have, we continue to raise our concerns uh, with the government of Bahrain uh, about a fair trial. Um, is there, do you, are you concerned um, that there's evidence to support the claim that the confession um, for what he was actually convicted of, which is, um, I think there's a recognition that he was caught up in the protest, so maybe that would be unlawful assembly, but intent to kill police, destruction of police vehicles, and possession of Molotov cocktails, that that was all a forced confession? Because he says he just threw rocks. Is there evidence to support all of these other claims? Well, with respect to the evidence, I would refer you to Bahraini uh, authorities. Mm -hmm. um, are, I you would, are you concerned that there was a forced confession, I guess is my Well, again, I, we've, uh, I've, I've dis discussed that we uh, have raised uh, our concerns at uh, high levels of the government of Bahrain uh, regarding his safety and welfare. Uh, and his treatment in prison, including uh, medical uh, and nutritional needs. Uh, I'm not going to uh, specify that further. Mm -hmm. Were there? Uh, if I um, could, if I could also though mention because uh, we've uh, we have visited uh, Mr. Al Maidan um, uh, several times. We are in regular contact with him and with his family. Uh, so since his detention, we visited him uh, five times. Most recently, in uh, two years. Yes, uh, five times. Uh, the most recent was. September 30th, 2014, and in addition to that, uh, staff from our embassy in Bahrain have attended uh, six separate court hearings uh, that concerned uh, Mr. Almaidan's case. Mm -hmm. um, is that common that in two like that in um, two years you basic that a year when there's a con when there's an American citizen um, in detention on cases that you have concern about is is two is kind of two and a half times a year really a. Uh, um, sufficient, do you think, amount of time to visit someone in jail? Well, when we, you have we, to, we when visit. You ha when you do have concerns and, and claims of abuse in prison. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, I, I don't have further details to share about uh, the, uh, you know, the, the, the general approach of the mm -hmm. government of Bahrain in terms of access mm -hmm. to prisoners, but certainly we, uh, we always seek regular access uh, to Americans who are, uh, who are in prison okay. overseas. And, and just one more on this. You said that you mentioned the appeal. Um, yes. It's my understanding that it's not guaranteed that the Bahrainis will um, accept another appeal. I think that this is like their one last um, chance of recourse for a possible mm -hmm. appeal, and it's not guaranteed that the government accepts it. Are you urging the government um, to allow the case to go forward for appeal? Well, uh, if, if my understanding is correct, uh, there is, uh, there is a, a plan to appeal. I don't believe that that appeal has actually been filed yet, so mm -hmm. it would be premature to, to say uh, how that uh, will go. But I, I would re revert to the uh, statement I made at the start, which is we remain uh, in contact uh, with the Bahraini government, including at, uh, at the highest levels, uh, and we continue to consult with Bahraini officials on this case. Without getting into the kind of specific um, question, you know, discuss, diplomatic discussions, um, if there was just, this was just a case of an American who broke the law, I don't think you would be raising this case with, um, you know, the Bahrainis at the highest levels of the government. So why is this case being raised with Bahrainis at the highest level of the government? Is it about your concern about lack of due process? Is it concern about um, the potential abuse in prison? Is it all of it? Do you think that this was a um, disproportionate sentence for? Um, well, what? again, we have a variety of concerns which mm -hmm. uh, which I've listed, and mm -hmm. as but a the result of those, levels of the government would indicate that you feel that um, something needs to be done about. Do, do you think he should be released? Well, again, we have a, a number of concerns uh, about about his uh, about his treatment and about the the, the judicial proceedings, uh, which is why we continue to raise this. Mm -hmm. uh, we we take it seriously, which is uh, why it's uh, been a topic of discussion at the highest levels. And you'll continue to raise it at the highest levels. Uh, well, yes, we continue to consult with uh, government officials. And, and Jeff, on, yes, on this, go ahead. Um, actually, just quickly, in this time that you've been consulting with the government and raising these concerns at the highest levels. Has the State Department or the embassy there or the U.S. government as a whole seen any indication um, whatsoever in that time that the government has acknowledged these concerns and is willing to address them? Mm -hmm. 
Well, we take seriously any uh, allegation of abuse, mistreatment, uh, or torture, and that's why we've raised uh, our concerns about the conditions of his custody. Uh, we understand uh, that uh, in, uh, in response to uh, our concerns, uh, he has been given appropriate medical access and treatment. Um, uh, so I would, uh, I would uh, highlight that. Um, but again, this is a, a matter of ongoing concern. I would not want to suggest that that is the uh, you know that that would suggest an endpoint uh, to our concern. When did when was that? Do you have? I, I don't have specific details to share. Just on one that. more. Are you also raising the kind of length of the sentence? Because my understanding is that when the government hand, or the court rather handed down the ten-year sentence, the consular officer, um, who I won't name, um, expressed shock to the to Mr. Maiden about the sentence and said that she thought it was a disproportionate sentence. Mm -hmm. I, I don't, uh, I, I simply don't have a basis to make a, make a judgment about, uh, about that. I, I lack the information. And, and just compare. one other question. If you could clear up why um, for the last two years you've been saying that you don't have a Privacy Act waiver, I understand now that one has come to light, you're talking out about the case and that's great, but um, it's my understanding that the family signed a Privacy Act waiver um, some time ago. Um, I'm sorry, but you're suggesting... Uh, I'm suggesting that for the last two years you haven't talked about the case claiming I, I'm a not privacy act I'm not aware, have, I'm, not a, I'm not aware, but perhaps uh, I'm simply not familiar. I'm not well, aware that it's been raised uh, in, in the briefing over well, the last couple the of years. First time, this is not the first time the case has been raised. Okay, well that's, uh, yeah, I, I don't, uh, uh, I'm, I'm not aware. Again, I think there may have been a, a, a mistake in locating uh, the Privacy Act uh, waiver, uh, but uh, clearly, you know, we've had a lengthy discussion where we're, we're we've got the uh, uh, the authorization to speak about it, and uh, Thank you. therefore we're doing so. Um, anything on this topic? Okay, we can move on. Uh, Elliot, yeah, Ukraine. please. Uh, I know the Vice President already spoke to this, but do you have any reaction to the new uh, Ukrainian legislative coalition being agreed to? Right. We welcome today's uh, signing of an agreement <clears throat> among all five participating political parties in Ukraine to form a coalition government. This is an important and transparent step in the formation of a new government as a result of last month's parliamentary elections. And uh, we will continue to support the government uh, of Ukraine in its efforts to build a more prosperous, uh, unified, and democratic society. Of course, the Vice President uh, is there, and uh, he's, you know, his, his presence uh, certainly underscores that uh, at the highest levels. And then the uh, coalition has also laid out uh, its major sort of policy and, and uh, political goals of um, including, and in, that includes uh, aiming to join NATO and returning Crimea to Ukrainian control. Does the U.S. support this agenda? Well, first of all, nobody, um, aside from Russia, recognizes uh, the, uh, the illegal occupation and attempt to annex uh, Crimea. So um, that shouldn't come as a surprise uh, to anyone. Um, I would also uh, say that uh, you know, the, uh, the people of Ukraine um, and in, through their commitment to democratic values and principles um, have, and, and the elections um, have supported uh, politicians who are focused on reform um, in, a, in a wide variety of areas. Uh, so uh, reform, anti-corruption, and those sorts of uh, issues are extremely important to, to them, and we think that emphasis um, is, is, is important. Um, now, with, with respect to their uh, security um, uh, policy and uh, their calls uh, for uh, ties with NATO, uh, our policy is that the door remains open and the countries that are willing to contribute to security in the Euro-Atlantic Alliance, uh, in the Euro-Atlantic space, are welcome to apply for membership. Um, each application is considered on its merits. Uh, ultimately, ultimately, that's a Ukrainian decision uh, to make. Russians have already said that they would need a 100% uh, guarantee that Ukraine will not join NATO. Given that statement, do you think that this is a positive step toward reconciling with Russia? Or do you see it as something that could possibly make tensions even worse? Uh, which step do you mean? The step of moving toward joining NATO. I thought you might have meant the Russian uh, call for a veto over uh, Ukraine's own sovereign decisions. Um, well. Anyway, um, the, uh, the United States remains committed uh, to NATO's open door policy uh, and to previous decisions by the alliance. Uh, again, the Ukrainians have the right uh, to, uh, to make their own decisions uh, about what policies they want to pursue. That's, uh, that's really uh, their responsibility. Okay. Anything else on Ukraine? Yeah. 
Yes, please. Just given the amount of the number of deaths in eastern Ukraine in um, the last several months, does the United States still recognize or believe that a ceasefire is in place? Well, the unfortunately, uh, the root of the problem in eastern Ukraine remains the same. Uh, Russia's violation of Ukraine's sovereignty and territorial integrity uh, and its uh, support to separatists um, who are who are fighting against uh, Ukrainian authorities. Um, time and again, Russia has made commitments, has failed to live up to them, and then later offered explanations that uh, that it knows uh, and uh, the rest of us know are untrue. So, um, you know, we think that uh, the ceasefire needs uh, to be uh, observed and that Russia and the separatists need to abide by the Minsk uh, agreements, uh, and uh, that's essential for a peaceful way forward. But you just laid out a, a very good argument for why the ceasefire is really no longer in place, given all no, I'm the not, I'm not going to draw that conclusion. Uh, we think that, this, uh, we, of course, uh, there is uh, activity of concern, um, and that's why we call on Russia and the separatists to abide by their commitments. Uh, in the in the Minsk uh, in the Minsk protocols, uh, and uh, that's that's essential. There, there are uh, you know the Ukrainian authorities uh, have uh, have done what's been expected of them uh, under the Minsk agreements. Um, that hasn't been reciprocated. So, would there be any kind of policy adjustment by the United States if the ceasefire were to be called off? Uh, that's – I'd put that in the hypothetical category. Probably. But, I mean, it goes to the, back to the question of why not just call it as it is. I mean, there is violence happening on both sides, whether one is instigated and one is in defense. I mean, there's – it's undeniable that both sides have suffered um, attacks and losses. Well, the loss of life in eastern Ukraine is, uh, is, is truly regrettable, uh, all the more so because, uh, it, you know, it didn't have to happen. It doesn't uh, – and it doesn't need to continue. Um, and it wouldn't our, have happened if the ceasefire was really in place. Well, our policy hasn't, uh, hasn't changed. We've, <clears throat> we've uh, stated that we will, uh, you know, increase the costs to Russia uh, if it doesn't uh, take steps to – on its own and uh, through the proxy separatists um, to, uh, you know, to abide by uh, the Minsk – Agreements. And, and on that, do you think that the response um, to Russia or to the separatists, would that would, – is the United States still willing to take unilateral action against uh, Russia and the separatists, or would that be only in conjunction with the EU partners? Well, we've, uh, we've had broad agreement with our European partners. Of course, those kinds of steps are always better um, if taken in harmony and in concert, uh, and that's, uh, that's our preference, and that's where we, uh, we remain, um, and we remain on the same page. So, so you'd um, be unwilling to take unilateral steps? No, I didn't say that. Um, Would you I, be willing it, to take unilateral steps? Well, we're not in a situation where we need to contemplate that because we have a, a, a broad understanding and a, you know, similar point of view with our European partners with respect to the steps Russia needs to take and the ways in which the costs to Russia should increase uh, if, they, if they fail uh, mm -hmm. to, uh, to abide by the agreements. Yes? It, not only have they not abided by the agreements, but by uh, the assessments of senior NATO officials and senior U.S. government officials, they have blatantly violated them. I mean, Deputy Secretary Blinken, Deputy Secretary Designate or nominee Blinken, said that you have very strong uh, evidence that they have sent uh, troops and material into uh, eastern Ukraine. Um, why uh, haven't you already, given the harmony uh, with the Europeans, uh, why haven't you already broadened the scope of the sanctions, given that Russia is not merely not abiding by, but is just – in your telling, is flagrantly violating the agreement? Well, we have continued uh, systematically um, in conjunction with our European partners to increase those uh, – increase the costs to Russia. Uh, we remain in contact uh, with the European partners um, and continue discussions uh, to that end. I uh, don't have uh, you know, further, uh, further description to offer. Are there any kind of discussions ongoing either just in Washington or with our – the United States as European partners um, to, as to how long Russia can continue to violate these terms before there is action taken? Well, I would dispute the notion that no action has been taken. I think we've just been before talking about – Before additional action is taken. 
Uh, well, I'm not going to put uh, uh, put a specific uh, time frame or a deadline on it. Uh, this is a matter that we remain uh, actively uh, discussing uh, with with our European and international partners. Sure, but it's ongoing, as you've said. So at yeah. some point. Well, it was just it was just about a week uh, week and a half ago that the European Union took certain measures. Um, they uh, at, at the end of a European Foreign Affairs Council meeting. So uh, again, there is a continuing. Um, uh, you know, ratcheting of uh, the uh, the pressure and raising of the costs, um, and until uh, un until Russia and the separatists uh, change course, that's uh, that's going to continue. Um, anything on this topic, or yeah, still on this topic. yes, just on the issue of um, Crimea, I understand what you said before about nobody you know recognizing uh, Russian annexation, but this is I mean what what they're calling for uh, as a top priority policy goal is a little different. It's actually restoration of Ukrainian control over Crimea, which in the absence of any kind of Russian action to relinquish Crimea would presumably require some kind of, you know, military action in, into Crimea. But is that, some, like, to what extent is the U.S. prepared to support something like that? Well, in the first instance, I'd ask you to, you know, ask the Ukrainian authorities uh, how to interpret uh, the statement in the program that was concluded by the five political parties. Um, uh, I'm not. I'm not certain. I'm not certain that it uh, that it necessarily means what you uh, what you said it uh, it implies. Um, you know, we in the United States have con have believe we believe and we have continued to believe that there's no military resolution uh, to the crisis in in eastern Ukraine uh, uh, or indeed uh, in Crimea. Uh, our focus from the outset of the crisis has been on supporting Ukraine and pursuing a diplomatic uh, solution. So what, what, let me ask you this then, what steps is the U.S. prepared to take in order to assist in that goal of returning Crimea to Ukrainian control? Well, uh, I, I don't have anything, any further uh, details to outline uh, now. We don't recognize the uh, illegal incorporation of, of Crimea uh, into Russia, uh, uh, but I don't have any, any uh, further um, steps other than what we've already discussed in this uh, briefing room before. Yes, uh, just uh, Pam, uh, on the same topic, please. Are there any new developments on the diplomatic front in talks in terms of whether or not the U.S. should move toward providing Ukraine with lethal aid? Well, um, I think you will have seen the fact sheet released by the White House today, which, uh, which outlines more than $23 million in new assistance to help support comprehensive reform in the Ukrainian law enforcement and justice sectors. Uh, and also to support the UN World Food Program's humanitarian efforts in Ukraine. Um, the fact sheet is quite detailed, and in, indeed it outlines uh, the, the full spectrum uh, of areas where the Ukrainian government uh, uh, has committed uh, to reform, whether that's in energy security, in economic reform, uh, and so forth. Um, uh, and I think with, with regard to the question of, of lethal assistance, we spoke to this uh, yesterday, and, uh, and indeed uh, Tony Blinken in his hearing in the Foreign Relations Committee uh, spoke to it as well, he, and uh, I, I don't have anything to add beyond our discussion yesterday uh, that this is uh, something that, uh, that remains an option. Um, I don't have an announcement to make, though. Uh, yeah, anything else on Ukraine? Okay, we'll go to Iraq, and then we'll, then we'll, come, then we'll come to you, to Jinder. Uh, the Turkish Prime Minister Ahmed Davutoglu was in Baghdad and Erbil over the past two days. Uh, how do you view Turkey's attempts to mend ties with Baghdad? Well, of course, we support uh, good relations between uh, between Iraq uh, and and Turkey. Um, that's uh, and and indeed, uh, Turkish uh, the Turkish government uh, has played a, a very important role uh, in in recent uh, weeks and months uh, in dealing uh, not only with uh, the threat that comes from ISIL in Syria but also uh, ISIL uh, in Iraq. And uh, so we're, of course, supportive of anything that uh, improves relations between Turkey and Iraq. And we know that happens at a time when Joe Biden is expected to arrive in Turkey today. I think he arrived, right? Uh, do you think that the two events are related? To, is Turkey trying to be a better partner in the anti-ISIS coalition ahead of Visit. Well, I, I, I'm not sure I'd characterize it that way because Turkey has been doing a lot. Um, uh, we talked about this yesterday and the day before. Uh, you know, Turkey is uh, hosts the largest uh, refugee population, people fleeing the uh, the, uh, the fighting in. Approaching a refugee population since the civil war began, because okay. refugees have been streaming across its border, that is not. Well, I was I hadn't finished my sentence. Okay. I mean, that, that's Please. not all that uh, that Turkey that has, has done. That has nothing to do with the coalition, right? 
Well, but we're not uh, we're not talking about uh, you know, purely about the coalition. He was talking about Turkey as a partner. Oh, I'm um, sorry, I thought he was asking as a partner about what... in the anti-ISIS coalition. Fine. Um, Turkey has also uh, taken steps uh, to uh, impede foreign terrorist financing, and also the flow of foreign terrorist fighters. Uh, and on the humanitarian side, uh, they have uh, contributed and have helped keep humanitarian humanitarian corridors open. So these are, uh, in, in, ad in addition to that, they have agreed uh, to host part of the train and equip uh, program uh, for the Syrian opposition. So Turkey is doing quite uh, quite a lot, and uh, we value greatly the uh, the Turkish contribution, which uh, I think is uh, one reason why the vice president uh, is going there. Uh, Turkey is a strategic NATO ally and a valuable partner. Mm -hmm. There's one more. Um, one more question yep. on Iraq, uh, on Kurdistan uh, specifically. Chairman of House Foreign Affairs Committee, Ed Royce, he introduced a bill, a bill yesterday uh, authorizing the president uh, to directly provide advanced conventional arms to the Kurdish Peshmerga. Have you seen that bill? What do you think of the bill? I think we talked about this yesterday, but I'm happy no, the to... Bill, the bill that came out yesterday. I'm well, I'm, I'm happy to talk about... I haven't read the bill, um, uh, and, and I'm not going to comment directly uh, on, the, on the provisions of the bill um, that is in Congress. But uh, we have enormous respect for the courage that the Kurds have shown and, and the fight that they've already taken to ISIL. Uh, and uh, that's why, in coordination with the government of Iraq, the United States and the coalition have been very supportive of Iraqi Kurdish forces. Uh, since the crisis began, the United States and members of the coalition have worked with the Iraqi central government uh, to send 46 plane loads uh, of needed equipment uh, to the Kurdish uh, regional government, and uh, we, you know, we continue our, our support. Can, can, we, can we conclude that top lawmakers of this country I mean, they're at odds with the administration on a lot of domestic issues, but also on this matter, which is very crucial for U.S. national interest, mm -hmm. like fighting ISIS. You are, like, on opposite sides. They want you to work with non-state actors, such as the Kurds, more closely than what you are already well, our policy, our policy remains, uh, as we've discussed it over the last uh, few days, uh, and as it has been, uh, indeed, for, for months and years, that all arms tra transfers must be coordinated um, through the sovereign central government uh, of Iraq. That's our, that's our policy. Um, it's also a legal requirement under current uh, U.S. law, uh, and we think this, is, this policy is the most effective way to support uh, the effort to, to combat ISIL and to promote our policy of a unified federal pluralistic and democratic state uh, as envisioned in the Iraqi constitution. So one more. You said on Wednesday that uh, the Kurdish delegation was getting to meet State Department officials Yes, on, on Thursday, yesterday. Well, they had a variety about? of meetings throughout the entire week, but yes. Do you have ahead. any update? Any I, I don't have a readout of those uh, those meetings. Uh, anything more in Iraq? Yeah, can I follow up on that? Go ahead. Um, I mean, I, I, it doesn't really answer the question of, you know, whether the policy that you maintain of supplying arms directly to the central government of, of Iraq would exist if it wasn't for the legal requirement that binds you to that. Can you address that? Well, I th as I think I said, uh, our policy is to promote a unified, federal, pluralistic, and democratic state, um, as indeed is outlined in the Iraqi Constitution. And so our policy with respect to, uh, to arms um, and the Iraqi central government and the Kurdish forces is, is a natural um, uh, a natural result of that of that so, policy. So freed from the legal requirement of having to supply uh, arms and equipment to the government in Baghdad, you wouldn't necessarily shift to directly supplying the Kurds. Well, I, again, I'm not going to get into commenting on on a bill that has been introduced, um, but which hasn't been passed. Uh, so uh, our policy is, uh, as I described it, uh, for for those reasons. We have the support of both the chairman of the Senate. Foreign Affairs Committee and the House Foreign Affairs Committee. I'll, so I'll decline the opportunity to comment on on who supports or has spoken out in Congress uh, on the bill. Um, on Iraq? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I just kind of want to take a step back, if I may. And sure. Since some things seem to change and some things stay the same, but if you could just remind me. Um, regarding the United States' involvement in Iraq and Syria, is it fair still to say that defeating ISIS is still the main effort? I think General Allen said that the other day that it's still an Iraq-first policy, right? Uh, but I'm, let me make sure I understand your question uh, correctly. Uh, you mean uh, with, re with respect to the fight against ISIL and, and where, our, um, where our focus is in that regard, or do you mean our policy toward Iraq uh, overall? Iraq and Syria overall. Okay. Uh, so the, well, I think the, 
as, as General Allen has said and as others have said, uh, uh, we're focused on fighting ISIL uh, in Iraq. Uh, we are cooperating with the Iraqi authorities to that end, both Kurdish uh, authorities as well as the central government. And, Syria and at the well. same time in Syria. So, uh, you know, but the circumstances in both places are quite different, and therefore the approaches uh, need to be well, need to be different. Uh, okay. Um, so um, I, I'm not, I, I don't have anything to add or change in what uh, okay. in what General Allen and others have well, said. Let me about just put this. it this way. I mean, I'm not trying to. I'm honestly trying to understand a, a larger yeah. point here. I'm not trying to back you into a corner. But right. we do have people saying that. Uh, what's happening there is a, an Iraq-first policy of defeating ISIS that will also spill over into Syria. At the same time, we have a policy of um, all of this must be solved politically, which means Assad must go. So I'm just wondering if you can explain the U.S. position on how these two things or where these two things come together. Because um, from the outside, there are two separate tracks. Well, uh, but again, are you talking about our policy toward uh, uh, ISIL uh, in Iraq and Syria, or are you talking about uh, our, uh, of course, our position on Assad is, uh, but is well known. But how does your position, how does your position. Th that is the crux of the, the problem. The crux of the problem. That's our question, too. The mm -hmm. unanswerable question that no one seems to be able to answer, which would make it unanswerable, is that how does your policy of a political transition in Syria fit in to your overall strategy for ISIS? Or how does the policy for defeating ISIS fit that's, in yes, that's a better way of with the it. overall strategy of a political solution that includes Thank removing you. Assad? Yes. Well, uh, w we've been clear that uh, our no, goal... No, you haven't been clear. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, you have, Elise. Uh, let me tell you that. Um, so uh, our, our goal um, is helping uh, the Syrian people reach a negotiated political transition that fulfills their aspirations. Now, this means a future without Assad or ISIL. Um, and as President Obama has said repeatedly, Assad has lost his legitimacy, um, and there can't be a stable uh, and inclusive Syria under his uh, leadership. So we're taking action against ISIL in Syria uh, because the Assad regime has shown that it can't and uh, won't confront, uh, confront terrorist groups effectively. So remember, of course, as I'm sure you know, but it's worth repeating that, you know, Assad's own actions have fueled the rise uh, of extremism. Um, and, and so, therefore, we are working to support the opposition uh, in, in Syria. Uh, we have been supporting the uh, opposition uh, for years. Uh, we're stepping up that, uh, especially through the Train and Equip program. Um, and that is to uh, help them uh, defend themselves from Assad, but also to defend uh, and, uh, and fight back against ISIL. Right, but if Assad's own actions have fueled extremism, can you really, truly put an end to extremism in Syria without getting rid of Assad? Well, again, uh, our, uh, our overall goal with respect to, to Syria is that the Syrian people are able to reach a negotiated political transition that fulfills uh, their aspirations. Um, so, uh, it, and we've also been clear that we don't see, you know, a, uh, a stable and inclusive uh, Syria under the leadership of Assad. Are, are these two separate tracks, or are they related? Defeat well, ISIL, unseat Assad, or is it related? I well, mean, I think uh, I think it's been clear that ISIL uh, represents uh, a threat not only in Iraq and Syria, but to the neighboring countries uh, in the region. Um, see a clear uh, threat from ISIL, and that's where the international effort is focused uh, uh, as a result. Is it fair to assume that the U.S. priority is, is defeating Iraq since, I mean, obvious and... Defeating over, Iraq? I'm sorry. Uh, I'm sorry, defeating ISIL, sorry, not defeating Iraq, but defeating the Islamic State, given that there has been overt and repeated um, action by the United States to fight ISIL. Well, I think I think it's clear from our from our actions, as you say, that we're devoting uh, you know enormous uh, energies, uh, energy and resources uh, to the fight against ISIL, both supporting Iraqi uh, forces as they do so, uh, as well as uh, in Syria. Let me put it this way: If and when Assad ever leaves, who takes his place under the current um, environment? Well, I, I don't have a, I don't have a, a prediction or a, a, pro, a prescription uh, for that to offer uh, offer at this uh, at this point. I mean, you know, we, we believe there needs to be a political solution uh, that embodies the aspirations of all of Syria's people, but uh, you know, uh, we are unfortunately far from that uh, right now, so I don't have, uh, I don't have any, any further details to offer. Uh, is it not a that concern like. that elements of ISIL and Khorasan and um, other extremist groups could 
step into that vacuum if Assad leaves? Well, uh, of course we are concerned about, uh, about Khorasan and ISIL uh, and other extremist groups. Uh, that's indeed why we've carried out, I think, over 400 strikes uh, in Syria in, in recent weeks uh, and months, uh, including uh, most so, recently just, a, just a, a day or so but ago. What, I mean, there's some lip service that's paid to kind of boosting up the opposite. I mean, I'm, train and equip program aside, um, how are you ever going to get to the day for an Assad-free Syria if your efforts at the polit to help not only affect a political transition in Syria, but get the opposition to a place where it can um, fill a vacuum left by Assad in the event that he leaves? And how is that, is ISIL, you ever going to truly defeat ISIL and see a political transition in if you're not working with the opposition? We are. I'm, I'm sorry. What I, you, I, what do you have in your book, like, recently, what has been done to help the get the Syrian opposition together? We haven't heard for months about, you know, kind of meetings with the Syrian opposition or any programs that have been done to help the... I'm not Again, I'm not saying the train and equip program, which is great, but the political opposition. I mean, we haven't really heard much about that in a very long time. Well, we remain in close contact with the political opposition, mm -hmm. uh, and I think in recent weeks we've talked uh, from here about uh, the, the consultations that Daniel Rubenstein has had. Uh, he's, of course, the, the envoy who's most actively engaged uh, on this. So we remain in close contact. We've, uh, we've spent uh, hundreds of millions of dollars uh, in support of the, of the Syrian opposition, and, of course, uh, that's, uh, that's without even um, speaking about the Train and Equip program, um, which, uh, which is getting underway. So uh, I, would, I would dispute the notion that, uh, you know, that, that we've uh, been inactive. But for your hundreds of millions of dollars, can you say that the political Syrian opposition is in any more shape to fill a vacuum filled by Assad than it was when you started? Well, they're if clearly under tomorrow, uh, the, I'm the political opposition is uh, is clearly under pressure both from uh, from ISIL and from Assad. That's why we are committed to to supporting them. Uh, that's uh, I'm going to more say beyond that. Anything else on uh, on this topic? Do, do you have any more yeah. details? Just to quickly follow up on Elisa, do you have any more details on the training and equip program? Um, in Not beyond years? what we talked about uh, earlier this week, um, which was just that. It was maybe happening. Well, again, it's a Department of Defense-led program, so I'd refer you to them for details about the, sp the sp specifics, excuse me, of implementation. Um, Did the program start? Uh, again, I'd refer you to the Department of Defense. They're working with, uh, with our partners uh, who have agreed to host uh, the elements of the Train and Equip program, um, but I'd refer you to them for yeah, the, you the details. you don't know yourself if the program ever started. I think they're putting in place uh, the, uh, the all of the arrangements necessary to uh, to commence. But again, as far as the details, uh, I'd refer you to them. Thomas. Yes, uh, you mentioned that the training the quick program for the, for the opposition, uh, but the, the, it seems that the training equip program is is to fight ISIL or to replace Assad. Well, I think we've talked about this uh, uh, already a couple of times uh, this week. We're training and equipping appropriately vetted elements of the Syrian armed uh, opposition um, through the Department of Defense, uh, and this will help them defend the Syrian people from attacks by ISIL and uh, the Syrian regime, will stabilize areas under opposition control, and empower um, uh, those trainees also to go on the offensive uh, against ISIL. The reason that I'm asking this question because opposition people, most of them are talking about getting rid of Assad and not uh, not just to fighting ISIL. And the second thing, which is, do you believe that Assad and his army, whatever his security system, are fighting ISIL or he doesn't do anything to them? I think I've said already at the start that uh, you know, the, the reason that you've seen the rise of ISIL um, in, in Syria is because the Assad regime has uh, shown no interest and no ability to, to deal with uh, extremist elements. Instead, it's fueled the fire. Arshad, did you want to add something on this? I, no, I wanted to okay. just, just shoot down. So. Can I just okay. finish that thought? Yeah. Why do you think that is? Because he sees that ISIL is going after the opposition and that's doing his work for him? Or, I, I mean, I, is I'm he cooperating God. with ISIL in any way, do you think? Well, you know, clearly uh, the, the Assad regime has not gone after um, ISIL uh, in, in ways that it could have. I, I, I'm not going to speculate about the reasons uh, why they might do that uh, from this podium, though. Um, so, Tejinder, go ahead. Uh, uh, 
first is that uh, Secretary Biswa is leaving for India day after tomorrow. Uh, right. For And you say internal consultations, bilat meetings. Uh, can you tell us how long she will be in India? How many hours? How many days? Uh, I don't think I have that level of detail about her, her schedule. Uh, we, uh, we put out an announcement about, uh, about her travel, um, and she'll be making uh, a trip uh, to a number of places, uh, including uh, India, also to Nepal, Bangladesh, Uzbekistan, and uh, to Switzerland. And that's a long trip. It's going to start November 23rd, go until uh, December 5th. Uh, I, I don't have additional detail about her uh, itinerary or her scheduled meetings at each of those stops at this point. And is it, connect, is, is it connected with the President Obama's visit to India in January? Uh, well, I, I'm, I'm not, uh, not going to connect it to, to the, uh, the President's uh, trip. Of course, you will have seen that the White House put out an announcement that the President will be traveling to India. Uh, but I, I think this is a – I think Assistant Secretary Biswal's trip um, is a long-planned uh, trip uh, for a variety of, uh, of reasons. Of course, it gives her the opportunity, though, to contribute uh, to developing uh, the, uh, the agenda for the President's uh, visit, but that's led by and the White House, naturally. How, how does this building um, – you know, people here uh, look at that uh, trip of Mr. Obama, like that, uh, it, it came to light through a tweet from Indian Prime Minister. So was it already, yes, already there was something going on? I think if you've got a question about the President's travel, uh, this is not the right uh, room in which to be asking it. I'd refer you to the White House and uh, No, I'm talking for, about for the details. diplomatic part of it. Mm -hmm. the, uh, what, what is the diplomatic uh, administration? Well, of, of course, we're, uh, we're excited that the, uh, the, that the President's going to India. We've, uh, we've had a, a great visit by Prime Minister uh, uh, Modi to the United States, and uh, we have a number of areas where we're cooperating, uh, some of which I outlined, uh, I believe, yesterday or two days ago, um, through high-level visits. So we look forward to that, uh, that continuing. So do you feel um, that the, the, with this visit, uh, we'll put a final nail in the, in the, as the coffin of the subject of Cobra Gade and then other visa issues, other all these issues that have been, you know, uh, really I, souring I don't relations. have anything to add on those. I think we've got a, uh, a vibrant and, uh, and productive bilateral partnership uh, that we look forward to, uh, to um, you know, developing further. Um, on that, yes, go ahead. Um, as I asked the other day, uh, so much going on between the two countries as far as uh, trade, economics, and other uh, diplomatic and uh, other relations are concerned, and a uh, number of uh, Agreements were signed uh, by the high-level officials in Delhi uh, during this uh, last week uh, visits. And uh, as far as President's visits is concerned, of course, he, he was invited by the Prime Minister Modi, uh, Prime Minister Modi, uh, in, uh, when he visited the White House and also in uh, Burma and at the G20. My question is, Secretary is going to join him uh, on this trip in Janu January 26 when the President will be at the Republic Day of, of India, guest of honors. Uh, I don't have anything to announce uh, about the Secretary's uh, travel uh, at this time, so I, I simply don't have anything to, and to add. Anything on this go ongoing uh, um, agreements signed and go ongoing? I have nothing to add to what we discussed on Wednesday. Um, um, Arshad? Yeah. yeah. So there is a report that the Sudanese government <coughs> has asked um, uh, UNAMID, the UNAU, uh, peacekeeping mission in Western Darfur to prepare uh, plans to leave, to prepare an exit strategy. Um, that doesn't mean that they've been asked to leave immediately, but they've been asked to draw up plans to leave. Um, uh, do you have any view on that request, particularly in the light of the difficulty that UNAMID had in first uh, gaining access to investigate uh, mass rape allegations, then in getting into the town to investigate them, but there being a very heavy um, Sudanese government presence when they tried to interview people, and uh, lastly, their renewed uh, request uh, to uh, continue investigations in that, into that. Right. Well, um, I'm aware of the report. Um, I, I became aware of it just before coming out here, so uh, I'm not in a position to verify it or, or confirm it in any way. Um, but <clears throat> I would 
uh, we'd refer uh, refer you and others to the statement that we put out about two weeks ago, which still um, is is pertinent, I think, uh, in this regard. You know, the United States uh, has been deeply concerned by allegations of mass rape by Sudanese military forces uh, in North Darfur. And uh, we took note then of uh, that the government of Su Sudan allowed access uh, to UNAMID to investigate those allegations, but we expressed our regret that the initial access was denied um, and that access to potential witnesses and victims was only allowed after significant delays and under close observation of Sudanese security officials. So we urge the government of Sudan to fulfill its obligation to grant uh, immediate, unhindered, and full access to UNAMID and other UN agencies. Uh, that was our position just uh, a week ago, and it remains our, our point of view now, but I don't have further um, reaction yet to, to those comments. It's a simple question. I don't know if you're in a position to answer it or not, yeah. but given your belief that UNAMID should be allowed to investigate these allegations, does the U.S. government believe that it would be bad if UNAMID were to uh, leave at the request of the Sudanese government before it has had an opportunity to conduct further investigations into the allegations? Well, UNAMID, UNAMID plays a key role. We think it should be able to, to carry out uh, its, its role. Um, that's, uh, I think that's clear. Um, yes, Pam. A General Accounting Office report on human trafficking states that oversight of contractors' use of foreign workers in high-risk environments needs to be strengthened because without consistent monitoring of contractors' labor practices, the U.S. government is unable to send a clear signal to contractors, um, to subcontractors and foreign workers. My question is, um, what concrete steps is the State Department taking to address concerns raised by the GAO on the potential for abuse of foreign workers, um, particularly the payment of recruitment, f recruitment fees, which um, opens the way to debt bondage, um, for those contracted to work with the Department of State in high-risk environments such as Iraq or Afghanistan? Well, we take human trafficking uh, extremely seriously. Uh, of course, you're familiar with our annual report uh, on, uh, on human trafficking uh, throughout the world, and <clears throat> our embassies devote uh, a, lot of, uh, a lot of energy to, uh, to trying to ascertain and improve the human trafficking situation uh, in, in all countries where we have embassies. Uh, with respect to that particular report, uh, I have to admit I'm not familiar with, uh, with its recommendations. I'm happy to talk with uh, folks here uh, who are experts in that area and get back to you uh, with more detail. Um, but I, I apologize, I don't have more at this time. Uh, Allie? Can I ask you a follow yeah. Do you yeah. know if there's any kind of standard for pay parity or conditions parity mm -hmm. for um, third country nationals as what? Uh, working as subcontractors mm -hmm. or contractors in security situations on behalf of the United States uh, government overseas? I don't happen to know that. Uh, I'm happy, though, in, in looking into that uh, question to see if, if we have uh, something on that. That sounds like a pretty broad uh, question. Um, well, I mean, but, uh, happy to there see should what, be some uh, kind of standard of, of living and security mm -hmm. situation yeah. for these people who are in these high-risk environments, sure. one would think. Yeah, so. I understand. No, we're happy to look in. I, I, don't, I just don't uh, know that offhand. Okay, thank you. Um, Allie? I wanted to ask about a report uh, today that details some of the reckless driving uh, violations that various foreign diplomats have uh, been, been, been cited for over the past uh, few years, and uh, obviously as the State Department is the de facto DMV for these folks, uh, these questions apply to you guys. Um, this report said that the State Department uh, has uh, dismissed foreign diplomats 45 times in the past two years because of reckless driving, repeated offenses. Uh, I just want to ask first, is there a threshold for which uh, that these diplomats would have to meet that they would be dismissed by the State Department? What, what is the standard there? Okay, well, uh, let, me, let me start off by mm -hmm. saying that, <clears throat> you know, it is important to to emphasize that the vast majority of, of foreign diplomats uh, and their, uh, their family members operate motor vehicles responsibly and in compliance with local traffic laws. However, the Department, uh, as you say, our Office of Foreign Missions issues driver's licenses to eligible uh, members of foreign missions, uh, and we maintain driver histories 
uh, on those uh, on those individuals. Uh, we have a, a, a points system that we that we use, um, and uh, similar to those used by departments of motor vehicles uh, uh, elsewhere. And if a an individual accumulates uh, 12 or more points over a 24-month period, um, then we will suspend driving privileges for three months. Um, and if there is a pattern of bad driving habits um, or egregious offenses, offenses such as driving while intoxicated, uh, just one example, uh, then those drivers would be subject to having their, their licenses suspended uh, or revoked. Um, so this, of course, depends on the, the infractions being reported to the department so we can keep track of them. Um, but uh, if, uh, you know, in cases of, uh, of repeat offenses or especially egregious offenses, certainly we, uh, we take action. Sure. And notwithstanding the fact that the vast majority of diplomatic uh, officials and their families are responsible drivers, there have been hundreds of cases of, of reckless driving uh, in the past few years. So I'm just wondering, has there been any um, uh, efforts by the State Department to issue some sort of uh, general alert or uh, 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 guidelines mm -hmm. to these embassies for folks who work here uh, expressing the importance that while they're not uh, party to the traffic laws here that it's important that they abide by the laws that are in place. Oh, it's, it's absolutely essential that, uh, you know, irrespective of any individual's entitlement to diplomatic uh, or consular immunity, um, that they that they um, that there be consequences um, uh, when they fail to uh, uh, to abide by uh, by the laws, and so we of course make uh, make all missions uh, aware of this, and we we keep them updated. Uh, I don't have further details about uh, specific yeah, programs if, if that I do. Yeah, you the same standards for your own diplomats overseas. How do you mean? I mean, like if there's reckless driving, or you know, do you the same dip, the same um, standards that you provide for diplomats? Do you have them for your own? Well, certainly we expect all of our diplomats overseas to follow local uh, local traffic laws. there have been numerous and repeated cases of U.S. diplomats not doing that. Well, and, and then and, and when uh, when appropriate, we uh, we take action. I, I know I've had to pay, uh, you know, one or two speeding tickets at uh, places where I've been posted overseas, uh, and it was it was understood that if Where you, and when uh, was that, Jeff? Um, <laughs> we'll talk about that afterwards. Um, so, uh, so certainly, we uh, we hold our people to uh, uh, to that standard Did, just, uh, too. Yeah, go ahead. Sorry, I just have a couple more questions on this line. Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll stop. Um, uh, I, I wanted to ask specifically about Saudi Arabia, which, uh, according to this report, uh, has more than um, four times the number of reckless driving citations than any other foreign country. Uh, and I'm just wondering, have any uh, has there been any communication between the State Department and the Saudi Embassy specifically on what seems to be a uh, a specifically high number of reckless driving uh, incidents that have been happening there. I don't have anything uh, on that. I, I'm happy to look uh, and see if there's more mm -hmm. to say. And I, two I more, don't. really no. quick. Um, the reporter who FOIA'd the document said that she didn't receive all of them because some were listed under an exemption for foreign relations, which is typically something that's used for national security concerns. And I'm just wondering what national security concern does the State Department believe uh, applies to the reckless driving records of foreign diplomats. Mm -hmm. Well, we have responsibilities under the Freedom of Information Act, and, and I, I'm aware that there were some issues highlighted in, in that story. We're actively reviewing those issues, uh, um, so I, I don't have uh, further, uh, further and, comment and beyond that. one of the that. efforts to uh, impose more transparency on the whole process has been some people have suggested that it might be uh, advisable to uh, kind of name and shame those who have repeatedly violated these, uh, mm -hmm. these laws but may not fall under the 12-point they may not be at that threshold yet. Uh, what's the State Department's position on, on listing? I'm not going to. I'm not going to pin down uh, specific uh, measures, but uh, certainly we take uh, we take this uh, seriously, and uh, we we continue to keep it uh, uh, under advisement. Uh, time for just uh, just one more, Michelle. Um, the UN Security Council added two branches of Ansar al Sharia in Libya to its Al Qaeda sanctions list. Do you agree with the UN's report linking the groups to Al Qaeda? So uh, there, uh, you are. Uh, you highlighted the decision by the UN uh, Sanctions um, uh, Committee. We certainly welcome uh, the designation of Ansar al Sharia in Benghazi uh, and Ansar al Sharia in in Darna as terrorist organizations by the UN Security Council. Now, the Department of State uh, in January of this year 
um, that we, uh, we announced our designations of, of both organizations um, as separate foreign terrorist uh, organizations. So this, you know, this uh, brings the, uh, uh, the international uh, view on these two organizations in line with the view that the United States uh, had, had expressed uh, before. Now, um, the, it, is, it is not the U.S. government's assessment uh, that these groups are affiliates of core al-Qaeda under Ayman al-Zawahiri, um, and uh, therefore we don't recognize them as uh, affiliates of core uh, al-Qaeda, um, but that doesn't diminish uh, in any way uh, how uh, our grave concern about, uh, about both these organizations and their activities. So you're not, you're not linking them to al-Qaeda? Well, uh, I think the document that the UN Security Council uh, has released, it does not connect, uh, you know, it, that these groups are associated with al-Qaeda in the Islamic Maghreb, um, but they are not arms of core uh, al-Qaeda if, uh, if you look at the, uh, uh, the report. Um, so uh, certainly we take these groups seriously, uh, and uh, that's why we acted uh, 11 months ago um, to designate them. Um, but uh, that's, uh, that's separate from, uh, I think, what, uh, what you were suggesting. They're like a second degree at al-Qaeda or something. Uh, well, they're, they're, they're they are, they, they, are they, they, have been, they have been associated with, uh, with al-Qaeda in the Islamic Maghreb. Um, but in which our in assessment, which in itself is associated with Qaeda Corps, which is an affiliate, but we we don't see them as being subordinate to or a subsidiary of uh, AQIM. Um, like there has been an association, like at McDonald's. Uh, I I don't think I can put it in those uh, kind of terms. Okay, um, thank, you. thank you very much.